Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, can you put it on standby for now? Fine. So, uh, today we're going to continue our discussion on, on uh, the uh, uh, honest covariant computation of, string, of the string S matrix. Um, in particular, we'll uh, more carefully than write, uh, last time write down the uh, path and table that we, uh, we're interested in, work out the Fadi Popov course in, in more detail, and, uh, uh, and then by the end of this class, also study, begin to study a symmetry of this action. Uh, namely be Okay, so let me quickly remind you what we started talking about last class. Let me remind you that what we started talking about was that our limited goal at the moment was to calculate string S matrix. Okay, so the string, uh, string S matrix elements, uh, uh, at least intuitively, is related to uh, amplitudes involving long tubes going off to infinity somewhere in space time. And going off to infinity in a particular way. That is, the vibration on this tube, once you go far enough, and each of these tubes settles down to a particular state of strength, a particular state of the same. Okay. Uh, now, inside there, you could have as many holes as you want. Okay. The number of holes would be related to the loop, uh, the loop order of the relevant process and in terms of the complicated way. And then we use the state operator map to relate uh, to reproduce. Uh, uh, to uh, 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 replace each of these long tubes by an operator insertion, which operator was the operator corresponding to the state by the state operator. Okay? So, our final goal in the end was to take some compact Riemann surface. Okay. The simplest would be a sphere that we leave. It, there could be some holes here, it could be a door or something, two handled. Yep. Okay? And we compute the correlation functions of operators. This is our goal at present. It may turn out that we'll be able to do more. Calculate the equivalent of offshell amplitudes. If so, we get lucky. It will turn out that basically we aren't able to do more. to do more. But at the moment, this is all we're trying to do. And we'll see why it becomes more difficult to do more as we understand the answers. Okay, great. So, uh, so, so our goal was then to write down a part of the table that uh, did the computation. Yeah. So let's try to be systematic. So let's say that the number of insertions, that the number of insertions of operators, let's call it uh, capital I, the so I operator insertions. So we can be calculating an I point function, uh, a scattering process involving I particles. Okay? And uh, we have decided that in, on whatever genus uh, surface we're working, we will uh, choose some fiducial metric, some some class fiducial metrics, which have the property that via a diffeomorphism plus wire transformation, any metric on that topology can be related to one of the metrics in this class of metrics, you know, via this this transformation. Okay, the the the, the class of metrics we were dealing with were labeled by some number of real parameters. These parameters we call Ti, okay, and uh, uh, they have a name they call moduli, okay, and uh, let's say that i is equal to one up to two, which turn out that, as we see as we go on, uh, the number of these moduli is always even. So that's the complex moduli, that's why. Okay, uh, we also wanted to balance the fact. That just asking uh, that our metric, you know, any, you know, it could be that there are some wild plus diffeomorphism transformations that don't that um, annihilate the standard form of the metric. Okay? Leave the standard form of the metric intact. For instance, on the plane, if we're really interested in the plane, all the formal transformations, which are combinations of wild plus diffeomorphism. Uh, wild transformations and diffeomorphisms leave the uh, metric, the flat metric on the plane, and that. Okay, so um, uh, I assure you that the number, while the number of conformal transformations is infinite, we will always be interested in compact Riemann surfaces. Okay, uh, the, most conformal transformations blow up in infinity. So if you compactify the plane, 
most of these controllable transformations will not be allowed to make significant transformations. And, and understand all of this. Okay, let's go on. But uh, uh, the one point about this that I wanted to show you about, as we'll see in detail as we go on, is that the number of these these uh, uh, these uh, uh, while plus diffeomorphism transformations that are unfixed by requiring that we stick to a particular uh, that the metric takes a particular form is uh, uh, is always finite, and uh, uh, so let's uh, let the num let this number be two j. That number we do, uh, to C. Number of objects. Okay? Since we've got, this will always, also always allow me. Yeah, that's why I do that. So since we've got two C unfixed wild and diffeomorphisms, just requiring the metric to be of a particular form has not completely fixed. So we, what we decided was that we will, in addition, take the positions of C of the insertions, C of the operator insertions. Okay, so we will assume that M is greater than C, greater than equal to C. Okay, as we will see, it will turn out that anything with M less than the violet C equality doesn't calculate anything physical. So the assumption will not be a physical. Okay. Uh, now, since each operator insertion has, uh, is an insertion at two points, because we're dealing with you know, two-dimensional surface, okay, uh, you, if we fix the positions of M operators to be at C specific locations of the two plane, uh, 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 to be at uh, uh, C operators to be at specific locations of the two plane, we fix an addition of two C diffeomorphisms. Okay, so what we do is we use the unfixed diffeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms plus y transformations, to put the positions of C different operators at specific points of the word sheet. Okay, so we choose these, uh, uh, choose the points of insertion to be sigma 1, 0, sigma 2, 0, sigma C, 0. Some given points, which could be anything you wanted. 2C was the number of 2C was the number of, uh, of unfixed. But each uh, operator has a position in two dimension space. So the sigma is a two dimension uh, uh, set of coordinates. Okay, so these are the coordinates that we will fix everything. Okay, so this was our basic set. So then, what did we want to calculate? What we wanted to calculate was the initial thing we started out wanting to calculate was path integral over all the matrix, path integral over all the fields. Of, uh, of, of, of a field theory, which is just the x mu's. Okay, then uh, uh, exponential of minus the Poniakov action. Okay, and then anything um, associated with operator insertions. And you remember that these operator insertions we could always choose to be integrated over the worksheet. Because what we wanted to do is, was to fix that cubes in space-time went to some specific points, but not that they started off at some particular point in the, some particular worldship parametrization. I mean, clearly that would be something that broke the few more than the It's nothing worldship few more than It's nothing special about particular points in the worldship. Okay, so the insertions are d2 sigma, uh, let's say, 1, uh, square root g of sigma 1 times v 1 of sigma 1 and m such. Okay, where this v is some local operator and we'll discuss a little more about what these local operators can be as we go on. Is this clear? Okay, so this is the thing that we want to start out on the again. Now, of course, the problem with this path integral is that there's this huge gate invariance. And there's a more important problem with the path integral. That is, um, we're doing this integral over all, uh, uh, all metrics, including the wild factor. But as we saw in our initial discussion of string theory, the thing that we're physically required to do is to do the integral only over 
uh, only over the uh, yeah, you know the while factor should be treated as metrics that are different because different by uh, different upper rescaling by a while factor should be treated as physically identical. Okay, so this path integral will end up calculating what we actually wanted it to calculate only if the integral over the while factor is actually trivial. It's a, it's a symmetry. It's just an overall factor which you can then throw out. Okay, so uh, we're going to treat both the metric, you know, diffeomorphisms morphisms, as well as the while frequency as a gain symmetry. Okay, uh, and check in the end that whatever we do doesn't depend on the while factor. Okay, we do it a little differently, but okay, so that's what we do. Okay, so. Fine. So anyway, so this is what we want to do. We want to uh, we want to calculate the uh, uh, this partition, this this correlation function. Now, how do we do that? This correlation function is difficult to calculate because of the gauge. See, so we use the usual Hadley Popov trick. So what is the Hadley Popov trick? So Hadley Popov trick in this context is simply the following. It says, well, insert identity into the path integral. Now we insert identity in the following fashion. We say, well. Consider the metric of your of your system, and that's what in G, and subtract from it the fusion metric GTI, transformed by the diffeomorphism omega, and then while transform. Okay, so. Uh, we know, okay, now this, this is one gauge fixing, gauge fixing delta function we want to insert. This is another gauge fixing delta function we want to insert. It's product over i is equal to 1 to c, delta of sigma i minus sigma i 0. That fixes the insertions of the first c operators to be at points sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 1, 0, sigma 2, 0. Okay, so we wanted to put these two delta functions into a path integral. But this was the path integral we wanted to calculate. So we can't just put these delta functions in by hand. Okay? So what we do instead is to say, well, look at this. Look, suppose I take these two delta functions, and then I take this and integrate both, and this is omega. See, the diffeomorphisms and royal transformations act only on sigma i. The only diffeomorphisms act on sigma i. If you're also going to change points, y transformations. Okay? Now, we, we, we say, well, look, what we act, what we're going to do is to insert identity into the path integral so as not to have changed what we, the quantity we originally started out calculating. So, what we do is put an integral over omega here, an integral over 2 phi here, an integral over, the, over ti. This is an ordinary name, yeah? And then we insert this quantity, delta Fp, which can depend on G and on sigma i0. And we demand that this thing is equal to 1. So we will define delta Fp G sigma i0 by this equation. Okay? So as we saw last time, as you know, intuitively what's going on here is since there is exactly, we be careful to make sure that there's exactly one value of these diffeomorphisms and wild transformations for which all these delta functions simultaneously click. Okay. For some choice of t. Okay? Doing this integral will give us something. What it will give us will be some Jacobian associated with the, the delta functions and the inverse of that Jacobian, whatever it is, is this delta x. Okay? Now since the integral here is over omega phi and ti, whereas this thing is a function of g and sigma i0, this thing can be taken out of the integral of us. Okay? So equivalently we could say that our definition is that delta f p inverse is equal to g omega d d phi d ti times these delta functions. And this G is the 
no, the G T i is the class of diffusion. G is the real dynamical metric that enters this. Okay. Now, before we actually calculate the entire entropy, let's see what we get by taking the stuff and putting it into the exponent. Uh, sorry, put it, I mean, add, you know, we can write this as this times one. And one is the same as this integral. So we can just in enhance the path integral here to be a path integral over dg, dx mu, d omega, d phi, d n. And with all this other stuff. Now, all this other stuff includes delta functions, which we've taken, been very careful to be, uh, to uh, choose to be linear in G. You know, G is one of the arguments of it. Similarly, sigma i, oh, sorry, I'm going to this omega should have been on sigma i, It's on the fiducial coordinates, you know. That, that, that. So similarly, this delta function here has sigma i as one of the arguments. Okay? So, in this path integral here, we had a path integral over G, and we had an integral over sigma 1 to sigma, uh, sigma n. But these two delta functions just eat up the integral, eat up the path integral over G, and eat up the integral over d, d2 sigma for i is equal to 1 to c. Yes. Initially, you had I operator insertions, right? We had, I think we called it M operator. No, no, sorry, what was it? I operator insertions. Yes. Sorry. M was the, I mean, one. Sorry, one. I said it wrong. The number of insertions was I. Uh, thank you. I had to be greater than equal to C. Uh, so the number of insertions is I. All of these, in the, each operator insertion comes with D2 sigma, and C of these integrals are equal to the integral. Okay. And the full path integral over G is eaten up by its integral. Okay? So once we've calculated this delta FP, whatever it is, okay, what would we have found? We would have found that uh, the, the integral that we want to do is simply an integral over dx mu. When that we have integral, well, then uh, we have exponential of minus s all uh, plus log of delta xp putting that in the exponent and then we will have c how many c of these operate yeah c of these insertions that are fixed to particular one so then the uh, i is equal to 1 to c square root g tends on v at sigma i 0 and then the remaining operating insertions continue to be integrated over all space. Okay, so we'll have a product of j is equal to c plus 1 to i square root g v of sigma i is equal to Is this clear? Some G labeled by Ti, then in the end we have to sum over these path integrals for 
all all metrics in our financial terms. We'll have to do the integral over t. We'll have to do the integral over uh, over some correlation function in some ordinary fixed metric conformity. Okay, it will be a slightly odd thing that we have to calculate. Excuse me, we, the thing that we will have to calculate is uh, correlation functions of some operators which are given positions and other operators which are integrated with the word sheet. And we will see as, as we go along, uh, we will be able to prove that the final answer will be independent of what positions we choose to insert the operators in, which operators we choose to insert them. All right, we'll, we'll check out that explicitly. Okay. So, once we got to this stage, <coughs> all that remains is for us to, uh, is to compute delta IFP, or even better, let's look at it. Okay, is this clear? Any questions or comments uh, before we turn to the computation of delta IFP? Okay, so now let's go ahead and compute delta IFP. So, uh, let me clear the tweet. For a, for a legal, 
For a lean group, you know, suppose you were doing an integral over all group elements, for instance, all unitary, you know, all unitary matrices. Okay? It's possible, it's always possible for a lean group to define what's called the hard measure. Which is an which is an integral over the group manifold. Okay? Um, with a measure that's such that if you take uh, u prime and say that u prime is u times u naught, then d of u prime is equal to d. Okay. For the u1 group, yes, the integral over a circle, that this, this half measure is simply the usual measure over the circle, d theta. Uh, and the action of the group is translation. d theta is a translation in, in measure. It's always possible for a finite group to group to find that measure. No doubt it was done by Mr. Harbour, uh, which is why it's called the Harbour. Okay, so we assume that in these much bigger groups of uh, symmetry transformations, there exists such a measure. Okay, and we assume that this delta function, well, that that well, that there exists a delta function that respects the symmetry. By which I mean, if you have a delta function delta of a minus b, and you symmetry transform both a and b by some fixed element, okay, then uh, uh, the delta function is invariant under this operation. Again, the analogy to keep in mind for the U1 group is delta of x minus y is the same thing of, as delta of x plus a minus delta of minus y plus a. Okay? Again, for the groups, it's possible to define such a such an function always. We assume that you know, it's possible to do it for these, these things and, and to move on. Okay. Now, um, once we have uh, uh, once we have uh, uh, we have these two statements, the gauge invariance of delta F B is obvious. It's obvious because suppose we wanted to calculate what, you know, so what do we want to check? We want to check that if we relate, uh, replace G is equal to G prime times omega times e to the power of 2 phi, and similarly with the sigma i, then we get the same answer. Okay? But you see, by the property of the delta function, if we make this replacement and then uh, took out this overall constant diffeomorphism from both entries in the, in the delta function, the delta function is unchanged. So let's do that. What that ends up doing is taking this quantity and multiplying it by an inverse diffeomorphism in an inverse, inverse right transformation. But then we use the invariance of the measure to change dummy variables in the integral over all diffeomorphisms to absorb that inverse diffeomorphism in inverse wide transformation into an integral over a redefined diffeomorphism or redefined wide transformation. So the end product of those two operations is the definition for the hardy Popov determinant of G prime. Is this clear? Uh, is this clear, everyone? Okay. So, 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 so we we demonstrated uh, you, using this this formal requirement of measure delta function that the starting point of determinant is invariant is gauge invariant. Okay. Great. So how is gauge invariant so hard? Because of gauge invariant, we can compute it at any particularly useful point. Uh, on the gauge of it. Now what's a useful point? Well we know that there is a gauge transformation that sets G to be this fiducial metric for some value of, of T, which is let's call that T I you know T I naught and sets this sigma I to be sigma I naught. Okay? So so there exists some Omega naught to phi naught. It sets G and sigma i to be equal to G of Ti naught and sigma. I. Okay. So we will compute one over delta x c of G of Ti naught and sigma. I. Because that's the same thing that we wanted to compute before. These two are related by gauge transformations. We've demonstrated that delta XB 
is taking place. Is this clear? Yes. So, uh, you said that when uh, we were, uh, let's say, transforming G to something like G omega and you think about I phi, and then try to observe it back into the heart mission. Wait, wait, so there are two steps. First, suppose G was equal to G prime. Let's look at phi, just for conversational simplicity. Let's, let's say G was equal to G prime times uh, gauge transform by some, some gauge transformation omega. Okay, let's not call it omega because omega is this dummy variable, yeah? So let's call it omega theta. Okay. okay. Then first we use the property of the delta function. That delta of we view the delta of A omega minus B omega is equal to delta of A minus B. Okay? So what we do is take this omega, uh, just right. So how how do we do this? So, so what we have here is delta of g omega minus g minus g ti, the, uh, and we decided to call it prime, uh, twiddle or whatever, omega. I'm mean, just systematically ignoring the fight. Makes no difference. Okay, this is what we. Uh, this is this is what we have. Now we'll take this omega, okay, and write it as uh, omega is equal to uh, omega prime, okay, times omega t. This we can always do because it's a group. We multiply by omega t in this. Okay, so then what is this? This is the delta function of G prime omega twiddle minus G T I omega prime omega twiddle. Okay? Now we have property of the delta functions, we cancel out this guy. But now you might say, well, up here, what we have is the integral over the omega. What we have here is omega prime. But that doesn't matter because the Jacobian for transfer, variable transformation between omega and omega prime is prime. So you change the integral variable, variable of integral to omega prime. And now this is now the definition of the value for what determinant for the metric G prime. And that this thing can is possible to do is a it's an assumption that it is an assumption. If, if once again if we were doing this for just finitely groups, the integral over all matrices belonging to a group. Then the, in such cases, it's not in such. You can prove it. But, you know, when, when you're doing these things, or, or, yeah, let's just say for all of these complicated path integrals, it's in such. Certainly, mathematicians won't believe that we have. We've proved this. Even, okay, yeah, but it's in such. Okay, uh, other questions on this? Fine. So, the, uh, so we decided to calculate 1 over delta fp of the metric in the class of special metrics that our metric is gauge equivalent to and the points at which we want to fix our special insertion points. Right, because by construction, we know that it's always possible to use a gauge transformation to put the metric into this class and to put the points into this point. So we calculate that those points. It doesn't matter. Is this clear? Now, let's do the calculation. Okay. So, you see, what we want to do is to do this integral to find what our delta del del So, what, this is equal to dti d omega d phi uh, delta of G of T naught uh, minus G of T I uh, omega e to the power of phi and then another delta function. Delta of sigma i naught minus sigma i naught.
Okay? Now we use one more assumption. Again, it's also true for these integrals over finite groups. About the nature of the measure of this path integral. You see, we can't do this calculation unless we know something about what we mean about the integral measure. Because then I have to by an integral, but if you say, don't say anything about the integral measure, you don't know what it is. Okay? But now we use, you know, you know, an assumption whose analog again for integration over groups is true. That is, if in the neighborhood of identity, the hard measure with no nonlinear factor reduces simply to an integral over the over the over the basis elements of the Lie of the Lie algebra. Understand what I mean? You know, suppose you take, like, let's say you have SQ2, and you take uh, the group element to be phi theta, theta A, T, where the L's are the three elements of SQ2. Okay? Uh, in a small region around the identity, this measure is simply D3 theta. Okay, so this is, you know, we, we don't get about proportional identities, we just want to make sure that it's not D3 theta times theta squared or something, right? Okay? But this, this is true of. Oops, and we assume that the analogous statement is true of the path and reference will be. You'll see how we use that as actually. Right? Uh, this is true because you know, you're just expanding this in red meters that I think it does something. Yes, but of course, it so uses the, but it uses the property of what du was. How is that? Well, you see, what we're doing is taking the R measure and expanding it in a amount. Right. So this measure was something very odd. Then this could go crazy. Now actually, but it's almost guaranteed to be true for the following. Okay, it's guaranteed to be true for the following reasons. That in the Lie algebra, you know, in, in, in an infinitesimal neighborhood, you know, uh, group multiplication is simply translation. You have to go to next order to see the difference between these two. So a, a gauge, a group invariant measure is a translational invariant measure in the Lie algebra. Uh, and there's only one translation invariant. This is D theta. Okay, so it's, if you uh, buy our first assumptions, this is not a new assumption. Okay? So, now what? So, you see, in order to calculate this determinant, delta F, which is some Jacobian, we only need to know what the integral looks like to first order in the neighborhood of where the delta function kicks. Because the, it's a Jacobian of first order. So we only have to get the measure right to first order in the neighborhood of identity. Because we tune things so that uh, the clicking of the delta function happens at identity. At no degree of them, no wide transformation. That's where then this thing kicks. So we only need to know what the measure looks like in the neighborhood of identity. Okay? So the analog of this statement is that we have to do the, the integral over the natural measure in the Lie group. In the Lie algebra. What's the Lie algebra of diffeomorphisms? The diffeomorphisms are generated by killing vectors. So you just do the path integral over killing vectors. Okay, what's the Lie algebra of conformal transformations of some function? This phi. That's simple. Okay? So the next important step is that for the purpose of this calculation, we can take this V omega and D phi and replace it by an integral over uh, over vector fields. This one by an integral of vector fields, and this is just an integral over phi. Okay? So this becomes D2 V alpha. The set of all vector fields generate the set of all the homomorphisms. And this becomes D V alpha, and this becomes this is going to be phi, and we still have D theta. Okay, correct. Great. So that's 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 for the mention. Then the next step, what about the delta functions? But now we can be less abstract. Because we know how infinitesimal diffeomorphisms act on a metric. And we know how infinitesimal conformal transformations act on a metric. Okay? So what goes into the argument of this delta function? Well, there's a path which, which you get when the extent identity, but that just cancels this. So what, what changes is you have delta of the change of the metric because of an infinitesimal diffeomorphism, which is del alpha v beta plus del beta v alpha, 
the lead derivative of that. Okay, uh, plus plus uh, uh, two phi times j. G what? G t naught. Okay. Now, of course, there was also the fact that this t itself. That is an integral over t. So this clicks at t i equals t naught. So we should add first del g alpha beta by del t i times del. Okay? And so now we have correctly obtained what this what the argument of this delta function is in the neighborhood of in omega phi and t space around the t. Is this here? Okay, what about the second delta? The second delta function was, was this guy. So once again, we know how a diffeomorphism acts on a quadrant. Its action is the vector field that generates the diffeomorphism. Okay, so when, when omega is identity in the sense of that, the remaining thing is simply V alpha of sigma I dot product. Okay, you see there were many sort of handwavy steps in getting from what we wanted to here. But once we got this, now we got Because now we've got you know formula where every term on the right on the right hand side, every term makes explicit sense. So now we can have it. Okay. Uh, so let's do the calculation. So, you know, actually, it's not like what we're after is, is some explicit. What we want to do is take this answer and process it, put it into a form that is useful for doing calculations later on in string theory. So the form that we put it in is the form. The first thing we'll do is to use the famous identity from delta function that tells you that uh, uh, delta of x is integral over k to the power k up to two pi's that are of absolutely no relevance at the level of which we are doing this calculation. Dropping all constant factors. Okay? So, um, what we've got here is a delta function in the space of matrix. Okay? So, uh, uh, we use this identity twice. Once here and once here. So, okay, let's clean this out. So the first place we use this identity is we have we have one over delta x p is equal to now we have many integrals like integral of v v alpha d phi d t i and then we have let's call it b d b alpha beta this will be the the Lagrange multiplier for for this delta function. And then uh, we'd have uh, D, and let's call it something else, D U R S R. R, let's call it R. Okay. R I. Okay. R I alpha at sigma naught. The Lagrange multiplies for this delta function. And this i runs i is equal to 1 to c. And then we have exponential of i times Lagrange multiplier times this stuff. So b alpha beta times this stuff. So whatever it is, is in this delta function. Plus i times r i alpha times this concept, V alpha of sigma i Let's not call this function, it's just some discount.
everything. All I've done is repeat this, take this equation and rewrite it with an integral expression for the next Okay, now uh, uh, there's actually one more thing that we have to be careful about here. You know, we want everything in the game to be diffeomorphically invariant. So when, when I write this, there's of course an integral here, and I'll put a square root g. I'll put a square root g so, so that my integration variable b now transforms like an ordinary case. So it's like a if you're more quickly in there, you get your Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, if we were able to carefully define our delta functions and so on, this would automatically come out. Because everything, we're taking trouble to get data. Okay, great. So, now if we have this line, now we're very long. You see, at this point, let's do some of these integrals. Let's do those three integrals. Well, uh, uh, I actually just want to do one of the integrals that will make life The integral that I want to do is the integral of the You see, phi couples very simply, it just multiplies this b alpha beta by g alpha beta, and you do the integral of phi. So what does phi couple do? Phi couples to the trace of the alpha. And the integral over phi, the, the graph multiply phi, sets the trace of g, uh, sets the trace, gives you a delta function that tells you that the trace of b alpha beta is zero. Is this clear? Okay? So we can drop the integral over phi. Provided we take care to ensure that we only do path integral over traceless BI. Okay, so that's the next step. So, so 1 over delta FB is equal to integral over dV alpha, node dPi, di. D Ri Okay? And then exponential of now that's write everything out explicitly. Exponential of i times uh, of i times integral square root g b alpha beta. Since b is traceless, we don't have to worry about this g alpha beta term. Times del alpha b beta plus del beta alpha. Plus i times this stuff. R alpha V I of sigma I dot. And, and D B. Well, the power integral of B here is now only over traces. Only over traces. Okay, so we 
we have the formula of delta fp, now one over delta fp, is the same thing, provided all variables are typically anti commuting So I just rewrite the names of the variables to make them more standard. Actually, b is already. already. So I'll just dc alpha, dti, dri, d, d, b alpha beta, times this exponential. Alpha i uh, square root g p alpha beta del alpha c beta plus del beta c alpha uh, plus r alpha v uh, c uh, alpha z i not where every field in the, in the path level now is anti commuting right Again, so, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, actually, sorry. So, the part that's the determinant, I should have said this more clearly, this Okay, whether the metal fire on the sun dynamic equation should be It's had always 
this procedure been completely consistent? You know, have we been doing things correctly? Would that depend on those guys? But it does depend on you. So the, so the, the final integral over uh, omega and phi is just an integral over one. See, because we have that integral left, but those things don't enter the, uh, the, the answer. Anymore. However, Ti does enter the answer because the metric is replaced by G of Ti. Okay, so that 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 is there. So, in other words, can you say this, in this one, the, the matrix that we face by introducing this delta function uh, is basically the function of the Ti also. So, so yes. So and then we, we have to do the calculation in one of these six metrics, and in the end, integrate the answer over all such metrics, all, all such classes metrics. that you have. All the metrics. In. Exactly. Okay, now let's do the integral over Ri and Zeta. The integral over Ri and Zeta is very simple. You see, because uh, these things are anti commuting coordinates. So we take this exponential and we expand it. The terms that are of order, you know, the, this Taylor expansion of the exponential ends at first order. Okay, so suppose we got something like e to the power a, b, where a and b are both anti this is equal to 1 plus ab plus ab squared by 2 blah blah blah. So this is 0 because we take a through b up to a minus sign and then we get a squared which is 0. Okay? And that's the form that we have here. So the, this exponential can be replaced by the, uh, well, this integral over 1 which gives you zero. Remember that the integral over of a constant over an anti-commuting number is zero. Okay. Then there's the integral over r times c. The integral is of the r, but you keep the c. Okay. Similarly, here there's the integral over z, z i. Okay. I mean, the key point that I'm using here is that there are no derivatives of r or derivatives of z i that enter the action. If the derivatives becomes a, a difficult couple problem. That's why I can't do the same thing here. But since there are no derivatives, you can just do the integral once and for all. Okay? So what this gives you an ex explicit insertion of C of alpha at sigma is zero. And this gives you an explicit insertion of whatever is left. Okay? So, so we have delta F P is equal to integral D C alpha D zeta i now. D B alpha beta, then exponential of uh, I times square root G B alpha beta, del alpha C beta plus del beta C alpha. Then this has gone away. What we have instead is product I is equal to 1 to C, C alpha of sigma I naught. And product i is equal to 1 to m, the number of moduli. And I'll invent some notation. The notation will be b alpha beta del g alpha beta by del g i. So, this is a notation that's often used in Kochinsky. It denotes the inner product between two tensors of the same rank. And what it means is take this tensor. Contract with this tensor, multiply the metric and integrate over the Okay, that's what we have here. Okay, B alpha beta times this thing times by G integrate over the Okay, so this is great. This is our final expression. For the public. Okay, remember that the integral over B is only over uh, traceless, uh, traceless symmetric matrices. The symmetric because the Lagrange multiply for metric is symmetric. Symmetric is symmetric. Okay. Now what? This okay looks simple, but it's even simpler than you think. It's even simpler than you think for the following. Let us now choose, and I assure you this is always possible in every month service. 
Let us now choose our conformal class of metrics to be locally always flat, uh, conformally flat. You know, a special class. Let's choose that so that G alpha beta I okay, takes the form uh, G alpha beta Pi takes the form e to the power uh, phi of sigma. Uh, then, at least in some coordinates, you know, patch wise in the coordinate system. In the simplest case of the torus of the sphere, you can do it globally, otherwise, you might have to do this patch wise. Delta. So this phi is also better. Okay, so we're choosing our um, uh, it's global issues that we determine. You might say that when all of these things are equivalent to each other, large classes of them will be equivalent to each other under wide transformations, but there, there might be global obstructions to why we scale all of them to identity, as we will discuss in detail as we look at very specific remote services. Okay? But now all, at the moment we just were interested in a local analysis. Okay? So lo locally the metric is conformally flat. In this situation, with such a choice, okay, with such a choice of uh, uh, of metrics, this actually becomes even simpler than you might have thought. The reason for that, and it becomes simpler once once you choose the index structure, right? So what we're interested in is integral square root g b alpha beta del alpha c beta plus del beta c alpha. Now what do we say about that? The first thing is that we're only interested in traceless b. But in this conformal coordinate system, traceless is very simple. Right? It simply means that the only non-zero components of b are the now we use the ZZ, the Z and Z components. The only non zero components of B are BZZ and BZ bar. There's no ZZ bar. Uh, there's no ZZ bar uh, component, as we've seen many times. Okay? So, let's work out what this is in, in coordinates. This is integral square root G, BZZ. Okay? Integral square root G, BZZ, del Z, C, Z. With some factor two, because these two things are the same, plus something else with z, uh, with z replaced by z. Okay, this is fair. Okay, now let's work this out even more. Uh, what is del z? Del z is equal to gz z bar times del z bar because the metric has no z z component. Okay? Therefore, uh, uh, therefore, uh, we can rewrite this as uh, integral square root g gz z bar times. So let's work out the first term. Second term will be very similar. BZZ del Z bar of CZ. Now, the first thing you know is that for the formal metric metric of this form, this quantity is simply identity. The inverse of the metric, if the ZZ bar component of the inverse of the metric, cancels the determinant of the metric. Okay. So, this thing is simply BZZ. Times del bar of del bar of CZ. Now, what, we, what can we say about del bar of CZ? Okay. So, what is del bar of CZ? Of course, this quantity is equal to del bar of CZ plus what? Well, Z, Z bar alpha of CI. Well, that, where is the usual down? And now, what, what can we say about this concept? 
See, because when we lower this, this will become a zeta bar. This is proportional to, that thing is proportional to uh, G z bar uh, alpha z bar minus sign plus G z bar z bar alpha plus G z bar alpha z bar. Is this clear? I lower this, this becomes a z bar. And then I'm supposed to make this, the, this, the, this times this metric derivative with respect to that. That's this one. Plus this times this metric derivative with respect to that. That's this one. Plus this times this metric and minus this times this metric with respect to that. That's this one. But these two are identical, so they cancel. And this is zero because g z z bar z z bar. The only non-zero component of G is the G Z Z Z Z bar. This is also zero. This Krishna symbol that you have written down seems to me it was in terms of two kind of uh, coordinates, right? And what do you mean? And the alphas are different to the alpha is either zero or zero. And I just I could make the same argument for alpha equals z, alpha equals z, but it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, uh, what alpha has played no role in this? Okay? And therefore the Christopher symbol this is just zero. So this thing is simply d2 sigma bzz del z bar c. So in a locally conformally flat coordinate system, this uh, uh, this the Padi Popov determinant, okay, the Padi Popov determinant is incredibly simple. It's just just this object. Now, you see this action, as we've seen, you see the action is independent of this part, which in particular tells us that it's wide open. It's wide invariant provided we regard C, CZ and BZZ bar as wide scales. Okay, if under wide transformation, this is neutral, this is neutral. We've already seen that all other factors by the wide factor cancel out. So okay. Okay? Now remember that conformal transformations are special. Conformal transformations are those those coordinate transformations that leave you know metrics of these forms unchanged. Now conformal transformations made up of a wire transformation plus a different one. We see that B and C have weights zero under wire transformations. Okay? Therefore their conformal weight is given completely by their diffeomorphism. But the diffeomorphism weight is given by index. A, a lower z index has the same diffeomorphism weight as a derivative, therefore weight 1. So this quantity okay, is weight 2. But this quantity is weight minus. Okay? And now you recognize this, this theory. This is the BC conformal field theory at lambda equals 2. Or lambda equals whatever the value was that said uh, the weight of B to B minus 2 and the weight of C to B 1. B to B is 2 and C to B minus 1. Right? It's the special value that we worked out the state operator math. That was lambda equals 2. Right? B was lambda and uh, C was weight 1 and C. Exactly. Okay, so we have weight lambda, weight one minus lambda, and lambda equals two. This matches. Okay. So, um, so what's what's the final result? The final result is that if we choose this fiducial metric to be of this this locally conformal form, form, then the action of the final part of the network we have to do for string theory is very less. 
Oke, okay. saya tampil ya. Right. Oh. 
Now, uh, what I am a little bit confused about is there, uh, we, uh, this was multiplied by 1 psi and therefore since you did, did the integration, you got the coefficient as this. Each of the Yeah. So, uh, why can't, I mean, this g's are in general functions of d, right? Right. Then derivative of this with respect to ti's will give you in general some function of di, right? Right, right, right. And uh, when you when you are replacing those ti in that definition by size, then you should replace all those into size, right? No, no. Uh, you, you see, the, the, the thing that got converted into the integral over over, over Zai was integral over delta. Oh, yeah. Remember, it's just we're linearizing the solver of delta for the Jacobian of a delta. Is this clear?
we were trying to see that it has the the properties one expects of a consistent S matrix. Okay, firstly, like, lower our properties, it like, doesn't make sense under quadratic definitions. We will also check that it's embedded under an interesting symmetry of this, this part of the technique of PR symmetry. And we will check many, many things about it. We will also then, in many examples, it will calculate it, just to get a feel for how these things go. Ahead. Okay. So a lot of the next few lectures, not a lot of the next five or six lectures, will be devoted to studying this formula. And various aspects. Okay, so um, okay, it's a very important formula, it's a sort of central formula in student theory. Uh, it's a very beautiful and simple formula at the end. Okay, so we're going to start our study of this formula soon, but before that, we have a question. This thing can be zero. 
The only way this thing can be zero is if C vanishes. It's either all the quantities that we're interested in calculating are zero, then curvature tends that will also be zero. Okay? Or uh, it must be true that C is zero. You see? So, none of this makes any sense. None of this makes any sense unless the conformal field theory we're dealing with has zero structure. If it didn't have zero central charge, different ways of doing the gate fixing would give you different answers. That's fine. the total central charge, the contribution to the ghost works? The central charge of the whole of the table. Because when we, you know, when we, when we change the metric, we change it. No. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Let's see. What is the central charge for the whole Well, we know the central charge. Remember, everything is in Euclidean space. We know the central charge of the x fields is each one. So if we were in d space and dimensions, we get a factor of d from the x fields. But if you remember, for the BC system, we calculated the central charge and found that another equal equals 2, it was minus 26. C is equal to So this whole procedure is consistent if and only if these two pieces. Okay. You see what's going on. Basically, what we did was to treat wild rescalings as an invariant. Because an invariant is the classical theory. But wild rescalings are really invariants of quantum theories. Because quantum theories may need a cutoff to be defined sensibly. Okay? And you rescale landscapes to that okay? so Even though we define the theory to be nice conformally invariant, on an arbitrary curve manifold, it's not easy for this thing to be wild. Okay? So, we could have rerun our whole procedure a little differently. What we could have done is gauge fix only if you want this. Left the integral over phi, the uh, scale factor of the world sheet, explicit. And left the final answer in terms of an integral over, uh, over phi as well. And the action for phi then would have turned out to be the value of the path integral of string theory, of this conformity theory, as a function of phi. This is something we at least discussed computing. We didn't compute in class, but I think it was one of your exercises. Now, uh, remember, do you remember we did, I, I at least told you that the answer is del phi del phi plus some um, Do you does anyone remember this? The, the point was take the, take the equation that the change in the action, the change in the path integral, is curvature under an integral variation of phi, and then to treat that as a function of differential equation and integrate it. So it's possible to do. If you guys haven't done this, this is an exercise I want you to do. Okay? And so then what we would have got, had we, jump, had we dealt with it differently, I'm not going to do this, just, just tell you. Had we dealt with it differently, what we would have got is path integral over x and phi. With a non trivial action before it, had C not been you know, in the critical dimension. Okay? So, phi would have become another physical field, like the X fields, except that it would have been a little different from the physical fields because this, as we will see, is the way I've written this, it looks like it's got the same action as there's also an R phi in this, in, this, in, this, in this theory, makes it different from the other physical fields in, in various ways. So we would have ended up perhaps with a consistent string theory, but not a relative theory. Okay? Where well, we would have got more degrees of string fluctuation than we started out thinking we would have had. The fluctuations were somehow in these five directions in addition to the transverse, in addition to the transverse directions of space. Now, that we will turn at later points in this course when we talk about compactification to the theory of this sort. And this Introductory point in the course, we're not interested in such complicated things. 
we want to study string theory propagating on the right and back in that space. Okay. If you want to do that, phi has to disappear as a degree of freedom. You take it over phi to be trivial, just a constant which we can just factor that. Okay. So at this first pass, that's what we are asking for. Okay. And that works only when we It's not quite um, it's not trivial that it works at all. And there's any value of d, any integer value of d for which it works. And b d equals square root of 3. Okay, yeah, it makes no sense. It's not trivial that it works by any integer value at all. Of course, it's a big integer value. We'll come back to that. What with the connection with the real world? We can come back to that. Okay, so that's the first thing. So this, this calculation gives us a, a second pass on the critical dimension string theory. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay. Okay, now uh, okay. now the next question we're going to ask, the next question we're going to ask is what about the operator insertions? You know, what operators are we allowed to insert in here such that we get sensible answers? Okay? Now, the answer to this question is given by a reason that's very similar to the answer to the question that gives us the equal 20 cents. You see, the final answer mustn't, on any legal question, cannot depend on the choice of fiducial cannot change under uh, y of these k's of our k choice in fiduciary measure. Okay, there was one place in which you could have entered in this basic bulk action. But there are other places in which you could have entered, namely in the insertions. Okay? Now, what are the insertions? Okay. So the insertions here, okay, the insertions here are uh, dz, dz bar, okay, times square root of g, so that's e to the power of 5, times v. Okay, so now this quantity, this, in order for this to be a well defined you know, insertion, an insertion that doesn't depend on this, the phi that goes into the uh, into the fiducial metric, it had better be that this V transforms under phi in such a way as to cancel this explicitly to the part of phi dependence of this metric. Okay? And now the well, a necessary condition for this, a necessary 